Uh, good morning. I uh, start off just about the, uh, the people in the room uh, that I've worked with for a long time, um, and there's a bunch of you, and, and you all know who you are. Um, I want to start off by telling you uh, thank you for everything and that uh, I love you, all of you. Um, you've changed my, my, my life. You've kept me where I am today, and uh, I'm grateful for it and grateful to see all of you in this uh, room today. Um, one of the, I think one of the best things about college campuses, uh, particularly your own college campus, is when you walk back on it, you suddenly become back in that day, right? And we were walking in this morning, and I remember the first time I ever walked on this campus in the early 1970s, and, and uh, my, you know, my daddy would come to football games, and he would never bring me. And so I listened to John Ward on the radio, and I listened to him describe the horseshoe and the team running through the T. And so when I walked through, when I walked on this campus for the first time back in the early 70s, I felt like I'd already been here, although I hadn't. I'd been here uh, through the words of the great John Ward. And um, that day I got to watch a quarterback play, number seven, uh, Condridge Holloway, who's still my hero. And I'd go home on the weekend. I didn't have a sports center. And they would say, you know, they, they, they would talk about the Heisman Trophy guys. And they never mentioned Condridge. And it always made me mad. It was like Condridge is the best player I saw. And uh, Condridge was the first African-American quarterback in the SEC. And, and me as a kid in the 1970s, I didn't realize that. Uh, he was ahead of his time. And, and so all these emotions are, are coming out uh, today because that same little boy who walked on, uh, this campus back then was being physically and sexually abused in his own home, right? Didn't know, right? That's the house I grew up in. It's, it's what was going on in my house. I thought all houses were like that. And so you, you become a really good secret keeper. And you go through your life and you do all these other things, but you have this thing back here that's still there that you haven't talked about that nobody's helped you with. Right, and you act up in school, and, and when you act up in school, uh, back in my day in Jonesboro, they, you know, they, they paddled you and they spanked you, and, and so I'd go to school and I'd act up, and I still can act up, okay? And my friends will tell you that, but back then I would act up, and, and so back then we had partitions in the school, and, and they would bring me around to the corner of the partitions to spank me so that not just my class could see, but all the other classes could see, all right? And, and I was a hurting kid. And, and I, the reason I lead with that, because I want us to look at what the root causes of addiction are. We're in here today talking about opioids. One young man's already stood up and said, hey, here's what's coming. He's right. It is coming. Methamphetamine, crack cocaine, all that stuff is coming. Guys, that's not, the, the problem is not the chemicals, although we're going to talk about ways to address it. The problems are the things that I'm talking about here, which are those social determinants of health and addressing of both adult and childhood trauma, and we never talk about those things. Now, I want to, I always like to keep myself in check. I love this place. I love seeing the stadium. I love this new UC. I don't know what you call it. To me, it's going to be the UC. Uh, that's, and I don't like the fact that the money wall is not there. And uh, whoever designed this place, the, the signage on the bathrooms, you really need some work on that um, because uh, early this morning, I walked into a bathroom and didn't recognize something I've seen in every men's restroom my entire life. And to the lady in there, I'm sorry, she didn't even know I was there. I hit the door. So uh, a, little bit of, a little bit of levity to, uh, for me today to remind myself I'm still an idiot. But uh, in my defense, the signage is not great. All right. So addiction is not a moral failure. The biggest problem that we face in the state of Tennessee in this country uh, with regards to addiction is, is the problem of stigma. You can have the best treatment programs in the world, but if people don't stand up, stand up and ask for help, it doesn't matter. So what I'm gonna to attempt to do in the next 45 minutes is give you a framework for every other thing you see here today. When we talk about interdiction, I hear the war on drugs is a failure from law enforcement standpoint. No, it's not, that's not true. Interdictive efforts have removed, uh, God telling how many drugs from the streets saved, I don't know how many lives, right? But that's just a part of it. Prevention efforts are, are waning, they're behind. We're not doing uh, evidence-based prevention. We're not paying the attention we need to uh, to adverse childhood experiences. And then in the treatment world, you've already heard one young man talk about the stigma that he faces when he goes to the pharmacy to get his medication. I'll challenge you. How many of you would have picked him out when you walked in this room? He doesn't look like what you think he looks like, does he? Right, yet when he goes to the pharmacy, uh, he's treated like he's treated, and that is absolutely unacceptable. We've already seen the overdose death rates up here on our screen. Tommy put them up, and I think somebody else did put them up. Tennessee is one of the only states that still has a rising overdose death rate. We're still one of the only ones. 
And the problem around that is the problem of stigma. So I hope to address that. All right, so I'm gonna start off picking on my own profession. How many MD doctors are in the room? D DOs or MDs? All right, all right. So I'm gonna tell every, the rest, thank you all. I'm gonna tell the rest of the audience this. By the time you leave here in 45 minutes, you're gonna know more about addiction, not than these folks, because they're here, than 95% of the doctors in your community. I promise you that. Because the truth of the matter is, is through all of medical school and residency, how many hours do you think I got on the proper prescribing of controlled substances for both acute and chronic pain? I mean, that's a lot of school. How many hours? Zero. I didn't get any. They had some DEA guys come in, tell us about drug schedules, told us to pay attention or we'd lose our DEA certificate. So we had that. I guess that is one, but that's kind of a threat. And we were in the second year of med school and didn't know which way it was up, so it didn't matter. All right. How many hours do you think that we got on the recognition of and the referral to treatment for people with substance use disorder? Zero hours. And yet we're somehow surprised that we're in our current situation and I would tell you that it's predictable. I would also like to tell you that it has changed. And appreciably, it has not changed. Guys, addiction is the number one health problem in the United States. I hear MSEC committees, medical school education curriculum committees talk about, oh, we don't have any room for it in our curriculum. Guys, it is the number one health problem in the United States. We don't have room for curriculum in the number one health problem in the United States. Yet we have an hour for maple syrup urine disease. Now, who has heard of maple syrup urine disease that's not a pediatrician? All right, two people. I'm not saying that it's not important, but I'm saying addiction is far more common, and I think that we pay attention to the things uh, that, are, that are killing as many Americans as, as, as being killed. Now, I'm, not, I'm only gonna give you one statistic today. This is my favorite one. If we continue on our current rate by the year 2023, which is, what is that, four years from now, we have lost more Americans to drug overdose than we've lost in every war in the history of the United States, and that's powerful. The problem is they happen in little communities one by one and people hide the obituaries. I lost my son or daughter, they're 23 years old. They don't put in the paper, I lost my son or daughter secondary to their battle with addiction in lieu of flowers. Please donate money to the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Nobody does that. Why? Shame and stigma. So that's what I wanna address, but I think if you look at my talk at the end of the day, all the things that we're talking about fit somewhere in this talk, and this was my goal. And guys, I am not capable of standing behind this. This is gonna be really hard for me. All right, so I'm gonna use, I love uh, quotes from great philosophers. We're gonna use two, uh, two, two quotes from really smart people today. The first one is Leonardo da Vinci. The second one is Mike Tyson. And, uh, <laughs> and do not sleep on my boy Tyson. Uh, I, I grew up in Jonesboro, Tennessee. When I grew up in the 70s and 80s, if you liked the arts at all, uh, that was a good way to get your butt kicked in school. So I played football, basketball, baseball, did all those things. Uh, and it wasn't until I became an adult and got into recovery that I started to appreciate the arts. Last summer, I got to go to Italy. My daughter was over there studying, so we, we uh, took a trip and went over and get her and spent a few weeks in, in the area. And, and we wound up in Paris, France, and I got to go to the Louvre. And in the Louvre, they've got the Mona Lisa. And I don't know if any of you ever saw it. It's about the size of the postage stamp. I was unimpressed. There were a bunch of people taking pictures of it. Sorry, but I was very impressed by this painting by da Vinci. This is Virgin on the Rocks, and I'm not sure how you do that with a paintbrush. It was uh, something that spoke to me. But the reason I use da Vinci, I think he's one of the three smartest human beings in history, along with Einstein and Newton, is this. Da Vinci says that we have to keep our, I forgot my quote. We have to be fearless about changing our mind based on new information. So for the next 45 minutes, what you think you know about addiction, I'd ask you to sit it over to the side and give me 45 minutes and you can pick it back up at the end if you'd like. But I'd like for you to keep your mind open just to some possibilities of how we might change the current overdose death rate we see in the United States and in the state of Tennessee, but more importantly, help more people get what I got because we know that we can do it. Help more people be able to stand here with their son over to, the right, to his right, watching him uh, do what he does and do what he loves, and then his son taking an interest in the same thing, and getting to do it. Guys, that's a dream, and more people can achieve that if they're given the opportunity. So I wanna, I wanna lay the groundwork for what Judge Sloan's gonna talk about in a little while, because we know what works, okay? So the two most successful groups with the treatment of addiction in the United States are doctors and airline pilots, why? Everybody says, oh, well, they're smarter than everybody else. Well, I got too many buddies that are doctor. I'm a doctor. That's out. We know that's not true, right? And I don't know about airline pilots, but my guess is the same there. Right? Why, do, why are they su so successful? So we take doctors and airline pilots, and they have a substance use disorder, any substance use disorder, and we look at them at five years. What percentage from day one are clean and sober of all drugs at five years? Anybody got a guess? 
78 to 95 percent. And that's a lot higher than most of you would have guessed, right? Because in, in addiction, when people get better, we don't know because they don't want anybody to know about their past, right? Because of the shame associated with it. I can tell my doctor friends in the room, they'll agree with me, we don't bat 78 to 95 percent on strep throat. This is one of the most treatable conditions that I know about, yet we look at it like people never get better. There are millions of us out there who've gotten better, but we went back into our lives and don't want anybody to find out. How would you feel if you had a disease you never saw anybody get better from? Okay, and it's why I tell parts of my story, why I'm gonna tell parts of my story today, because you can take the science that we know and I can actually put it in living situations that I lived through. I didn't know it at the time. So why are doctors and airline pilots so successful? We've already established it's not they're smarter than everybody else because they're not. Okay, number one, high quality treatment, inpatient, long-term, okay? Number two, aftercare, follow-up, and accountability. And number three, a little leverage. Guys, the longer that we can hold people in the treatment process, the better their long-term outcomes are. It's as simple as that. We talk about, oh, we don't want to treat, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to treat addiction with the medication because we're switching one drug for another. All right, I'll tell you another, med uh, another disease that we switch one drug for another. Type 2 diabetes. We treat one drug, we switch one drug for another there. Most people with type 2 diabetes have it, why? Don't exercise enough and eat too much. Guys, that's behavioral, right? And so why do we treat blood sugar? Do we treat it because the number's up? No, we're not treating the number. We're trying to prevent peripheral neuropathy, kidney disease, blindness, heart attacks. That's why we treat it. So we tell people, go out and get on a better diet and exercise. How many people do that? I practiced internal medicine for 15 years. I never had one. Not a single one. Now, did I kick them out? Because if they had addiction and they came back and they hadn't done that, I'd say, well, that's your fault. You can't follow the program. You hit the street. That's what we do if I treat them like we do people with addiction. I didn't do that. I said, okay, we get, we've got medications. We've got metformin. It's going to increase the sensitivity to your insulin receptors. We're going to drop your hemoglobin A1C. We're going to decrease your chances of having heart attack and stroke. That is harm reduction, folks. That's harm reduction. We do the same thing with addiction. The young man who stood up right there, Takes one pill a day. Look at him. He's employable. He looks good. All right? He's got a college education. That is harm reduction. Okay, but here's what we do with people's addiction. So we look at him and he gets out a couple of years ago. All right, when are you going to come off the medicine? Okay, well, why did we ask that? The only way that you can ask that, you view addiction as a moral failure. Okay, because we have reduced harm. He's not selling drugs anymore. Right? He loves his mama. He showed up here today to support her doing her talk. Right? He's got dreams of the future. This is harm reduction, guys, and we have to grasp it. If we don't, our numbers will continue to climb. I promise you that. So doctors and airline pilots, now, I'm going to prove to you it doesn't have anything to do with the degrees that they have because we have another place in society where we've got access to treatment, we've got aftercare and follow-up for an extended period of time, and we've got leverage. Anybody know where that is? Drug recovery courts. Drug recovery courts. What is the success rate of drug recovery courts? Okay, 75% of the people that graduate drug recovery courts never get rearrested, period. And that's really close to that 78, 95% number, I said. So we got, a, we got a choice here. And when I told Governor Haslam this, he said, that's great. He said, but I've got to build roads and bridges. And he's right. What is the best way to get the best treatment that we can to the most amount of people? And so that's what I'm uh, here to, to give a framework for today. So when we look at addiction, uh, every time I ever saw a talk on addiction, they had a guy up there, he's talking neuroscience, he's got arrows going all over the brain. I couldn't understand any of it. I went to med school, and it reminded me of a slot machine like this. I got no idea how to play this rascal. Although out in Vegas, there's a bunch of old ladies that know how to play it really, really well, and they understand all that. I'm an East Tennessee boy. I get this one. I understand this slot machine right here, right? When the three sevens come down on the pay line, that's when the money comes out. Okay, and so I want to explain addiction to you using a slot machine uh, metaphor. And for me, this makes sense. And it makes sense also uh, when I'm trying to teach doctors about proper prescribing controlled substances. Because what we do is we say, okay, we're going to come up with these chronic pain guidelines, and that's a good thing. And we, we're, going to, we're going to give them to you. We'd like for you to follow them. They're only 162 pages long, and they're single space typed. And you have 15 minutes to see your patient. Okay, it's all well and good, but what can we practically do? And I'm telling you, if you look at the slot machine model of addiction, you can get a pretty good idea of what to do in literally 15 minutes. And guys, I do this same talk in jails and prisons. I didn't adjust it for you all, right? And people in jail get it. Uh, and so I know we can get it. I know it's possible. 
All right, so it's, this is the biopsychosocial model, pretty much. So the first seven is the biology. I need to know what your risk of having addiction going forward is. If Dr. Nolan, actually you did this. Dr. Nolan had a car wreck. And I'm gonna tell what you did, by the way. So Dr. Nolan has a car wreck not long after he comes to ETSU, and Rob and I have been beating him up to, uh, you know, to death for, for several months. And he rolls his car, he actually breaks his neck. And my phone rang. It was at night. And I looked down, and it's Dr. Nolan on my phone. So I answered it. It was late at night. I thought I was in trouble. That was my first knee jerk. And I answered, and I said, Dr. Nolan, uh, you know, are you okay? And he said, well, Dr. Lloyd, don't be alarmed, but I'm in the back of an ambulance, and I've rolled my car, and they think I've broken my neck, and they want to give me pain medication, and I'm worried about it. And I was like, Dr. Nolan, it's okay, right? That's what it's designed for. But that's a good, that's a good starting place here because I'm going to prescribe. Everybody agrees he probably needed pain medication. What are his chances to misuse that pain medication going forward? Is there a way for me to risk stratify him? Because I'm going to treat it. Is there a way for me to risk stratify him? And I'm telling you there is. So the first thing I want to know is family history. He's not going to tell me about his substance use. Nobody ever does. What's the most number of beers anybody's ever drank? Two. Their blood alcohol can be 450. They drank two beers, right? I don't ask people about themselves, but in Tennessee, ask somebody about their relatives, you won't be able to shut them up. Granddaddy had it, grandmom had it, mom's, all this stuff, right? 60% of addiction, guys, is DNA. It's base pairs, right? It's in your genes, 60%. So I asked Dr. Nolan about his family history. He tells me it. I've got the first seven on the pay line. Second seven, I, and I'm going to go through these individually here in just a minute. The second seven is what kind of household were you raised in? Were you raised in a household with a mom and dad where you got to express your feelings? None of us came out of perfect houses, guys, not a single one of us. But were you a victim of physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, right? Did you have to be the parent to your kid, to your uh, siblings because mom or dad had a drug issue themselves or were incarcerated? Guys, those are ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. If Dr. Nolan has any of those, the second seven is on the pay line. And now all I need for the third seven is the social opportunity. What's the most widely available, socially uh, acceptable thing that people get addicted to? Alcohol, right? I ain't got to go far. Cumberland Avenue's right there. I drove up through there last night, developed a facial tick. I couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> right? So it's socially acceptable. That is the most abused thing. The most patients I see during the day are still addicted to alcohol because it's socially and widely available. What happened here? What happened here was what Tommy Farmer outlined earlier was the, the, the dyna dynamics around prescribing opioids uh, being driven by the pharmaceutical industry made them widely available and socially acceptable on a genetically and predisposed, predisposed population. That's how we got where we are. Now, when I talk about uh, addiction, I'm talking about all addiction because if we're going to make any headway at all, we have to talk about prevention and we have to talk about effective, use, effective treatment of the driver addiction, which is dealing with adverse childhood experiences. That's what we're getting ready to dive into. All right, so the first seven, you love the brain stuff, all right? So how many of you have teenagers in the room? All right, you all pay attention for no extra charge. I'm going to teach you why they're stupid. <laughs> they're not stupid, but they make bad decisions, and there's a reason for that. And I'm going to give you the condensed version. All right, so there's two areas of the brain I want to talk about. Uh, uh, actually, over here. You see, uh, about middle, middle way up through the fish are coming up the side. That is our go system. It's the limbic system, the reward system of our brain. I'm not going to get into the, in, into the individual structures, but we're going to call it go because I get go and stop. Now, the other part of the brain I want to talk about is everything uh, from that, that uh, uh, line going up, forward, the frontal lobe of our brain. Sorry, do I have a pointer? Yeah. Everything in front here is the frontal lobe of our brain. We're going to call it stop. So really, our brains are go and stop. And guys, even if you don't have a, a problem with, uh, with substances, uh, you, you make decisions every day in your jobs based, what I'm getting on, based on what I'm getting ready to teach you. Now, all we did is we cut my body this way. We dropped off the left side of my body. I'm looking that direction, and we're looking into the right hemisphere of my brain. And for the neuroscientist in the room, give me a little latitude. I'm not going to go down to the cellular level. I know how much you guys love that stuff. We're going to stay really big. So here's the go system of my brain. Here's the stop system of my brain. What's the go system of my brain responsible for? It's responsible for my desire and will to live. How strong is your desire to live right now? What would you do in order to save your own life right now? And I'll tell you, no matter how refined you think you are, you'll do anything. If I got rid of all the food and water in this room and we sit here and we looked at each other day after day after day, several things are going to happen. Number one, we're going to drink urine. I promise you that's going to happen. And not long after, we're going to start eyeballing each other to see who gets eaten. That's going to happen as well. Guys, that's how strong your desire and will to live is. That is a limbic system function. It is reptilian brain. This is the area of our brain that's hijacked by our chemical or process. 
And pay attention to that because processes have the same effects on brains that chemicals do. That's why we have to talk about the underlying cause, okay? So that's the limbic system of a brain. It's also responsible for our desire and, and or our, our, our uh, it's also responsible for our population going forward in time. Right? It's responsible for our species going forward in time. But getting back to that first function I talked about, when I open up the newspaper and I open it up and I see this almost every day now, Man goes across the street, leaves daughter in running car. I don't have to read any further. I know what happened. What happened? He's going to use. Why is he going to use? Because he thinks without it, he will die. Okay, that's the part of our brain that's hijacked. Your cravings, your desire for your drug are 10 times stronger than a normal person's cravings and desire is for food when they're hungry. So when he, I get people say, oh, Dr. Lloyd, uh, you treat pregnant women. These pregnant women just need to stop. They need to put it down. Can't they see the damage they're doing to their, to their kid? Look at, what they're, look, at the, you know, look at all the carnage in their life. And I always look at them and go, well, thank you. I, I, I promise you guys, I thought of that very first. That was the first thing I thought to tell them. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work because I haven't given them anything uh, to rely on from being the coping mechanisms to deal with the childhood trauma that's driving their drug use in the first place. And now their brain's been hijacked and their craving for it's 10 times stronger than their, will to, than their drive to eat is. So now when people ask me that question, I say, you know, you're right. I'd like for you to stop eating. It's as simple as that. How would you do if you didn't get to eat? Guys, it's impossible. So we can't just have these, these preconceived notions that people can just put it down. So that's the limbic system. It's also responsible for our species going forward in time. What do we have to do to go forward in time? Food, water, sex, right? So food, water, and sex had better feel good or we won't do them, okay? If every time you all ate, you threw your toenails up, you'd stop eating, enough people wouldn't live to be reproductive age, wouldn't matter if you didn't have sex, and then our species would die, right? That's how it works. So what happens when you eat? We get near lunchtime, you're gonna get all these cues. It's gonna get near noon, you hadn't eaten, your belly's grumbling, and you're gonna want something to eat. If I bring food in and you can smell it, I up your cravings. Not Now you're gonna eat. Take a few bites. Your body makes its own fentanyl, it makes its own morphine, it makes its own heroin. They're called endorphins and enkelfins, released in the opioid, uh, released in the reward system of your brain. It leads to the downstream release of dopamine. That makes you fat, happy, and satisfied, and that's why nobody wants to be the after lunch speaker, right? That's the reason, right? And then it's taken back up. So guys, that's how it works. Does sex feel good? Yes, sex feels good. If it didn't, we wouldn't do it. Our species would die. Those are all reward system uh, functions, limbic system. Now, everybody agrees food, water, and sex are good things, right? Can you think of an instance where food, water, sex may not be a good thing? Anybody ever tried to lose weight? All right, so that may be an instance where, where food may not be a good thing. So up until a few years ago, I weighed up almost 250. All right, I tried everything in the world to lose weight. About two and a half years ago, I decided this, and I want y'all to, uh, I'd like my propers here because I am a trained physician. I'm gonna watch what I eat and exercise. That's what I came up with. And I started doing it day after day after day, and then I started losing weight. I started getting in better shape. So I go work out in the morning. I went this morning, work out at a little gym called Orange Theory. I'll burn about 800 calories in an hour. When I come out of there, I'm juiced, but right down from where I work out is a Krispy Kreme donut. I love Krispy Kreme donuts. Uh, I can see them in my mind right now. I'm starting to be triggered. So what's the reward system of my brain telling me? Krispy Kreme donuts, Steve, you remember the last time you ate it, hot sugar, milk chasing it, the whole deal, this is what you need to do. What's my goal? Lose weight and get better shape. I have a fully front, frontal lobe of my brain, the stop system of my brain, which gives me insight, judgment, and empathy, okay? So now I can make a decision. Uh, I just burned 800 calories. Each one of those uh, Krispy Kreme donuts are 220 calories and 20 grams of fat. That's actually true. It wouldn't be a problem, except for I'm gonna have four. So that's 880 calories, 80 grams of fat. What happened to my workout? I should have stayed in bed, right? So my, my reward system has been overplayed by my frontal lobe, which gives me insight, judgment, empathy, helps me get to my goal. That's how you all make decisions in your jobs every day, right? Krispy Kreme knows this. Why? How do I know they know it? They blow the donut smell out in the street, right? It's funny. But you relate to it, and you know what I'm talking about, it's the same thing the dope man does. Same thing. Same pathways, same reward system, calling you, you see them, you see the area where you use, you hear a song on the radio, you get around people in your rat park who are still using, and it triggers you to use, and those desires are 10 times stronger than your cravings are, and my cravings are for Krispy Kreme, and I can tell you that's a lot. Right, So I'm getting ready to drive by because my reward system and my frontal lobe are really intact and I'm, and I'm in a strong place and they have one last line of defense and everybody in the room knows what it is. The hot donuts now sign, right? 
So it's that last trigger uh, to get me to pull in. Next thing I know, I'm talking to the little lady and, you know, and, and it's on. All right, so guys, that's how our brain works. Go and stop. And then you understand what part of the brain is hijacked by the drug. You understand that the cravings are tenfold stronger than people's cravings are for food uh, when they're hungry and, and water when they're thirsty. So what does that have to do with teenagers? Well, the first thing is, is the frontal lobe of my brain that gives me insight and judgment is not attached, is not fully attached to the reward system of our brain until we're about 23 years old if we're a woman and 25 years old if we're a man. I go into women's jails all the time, and I say, women, please don't date any dude under 25, right? That's good advice overall, and I know women can say this about men in general, but men under 25, regardless of any substance use, think right here, all reward system. They lack insight, judgment, and empathy, and guys, you can't be in relationship with somebody that lacks insight, judgment, and empathy. You can't. The opposite of addiction is not recovery. The opposite of addiction is relationship and community. You can't be in community if you don't have insight, judgment, and empathy. It's really as simple as that. It's as simple as that. So, so that's why your teenagers are stupid. Uh, they, get, they get to be 16. They drive down the driveway the first time. How do you feel as a parent? You're going to sleep with one eye open until they come back in at night. Why? Because they don't understand the consequences of driving too fast, of, uh, for God, God forbid, drinking. They don't understand it. We do. And so you just wait until they get to be 25. Now, Heath just turned 25. And so we've finally been able to talk again, and I'm enjoying it for the most part. All right. Thinks he knows more than he does, but we're, we're going to get better about that. So you understand teenagers. What about drug addiction? Why does this matter in drug addiction? Those connections between the reward system of our brain, the go, and the, the part of our brain that gives us insight, judgment, and empathy to stop are not fully, uh, I'm sorry, are arrested in development at time of first drug use. So Dr. Nolan comes to me and he, uh, he's been shooting heroin. And, he's, he, and I'm asking him questions, trying to risk stratify him and, and trying to get a feel for it. And he, he's, by belly button age, he's 40 years old. But the answers he's given me, he's about 14. What do we tend to do when people give us answers like that? We get mad. Our temper starts to go up. First of all, getting mad doesn't work, so stop doing it. If it worked, we'd open up a clinic, we'd get mad at everybody, it doesn't work, okay? So what I have to do is like, hang on a second. How old were you when you started using? I was 16. Okay, now I can start to move forward. You understand what I'm talking about? Those of you that work in the field know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, what does this look like uh, brain scan wise? All right, if you don't remember anything else from my talk, please remember this. That top, these are PET scans of brains. That top row of brains right there are normal brains. Don't get intimidated by a PET scan. All a PET scan does is look and see where radio-labeled sugar goes. That's it, okay? So if I want to find out what cells in my body are alive and well, all I got to do is, is stick some sugar in somebody, watch and see where that sugar goes, and trace it with a scan. That's what a PET scan does. That top row of brains are normal functioning brains. Look at them all throughout the brain, frontal lobe, occipital lobe, fully lit up. That second row of brains are brains of patients that have been detoxed off drugs for 10 days. So Monty comes in to me. He's got heroin addiction. I bring him into the hospital. I detox him, and I say, all right, Monty, you're good to go. You're detoxed. You're not going to be dope sick anymore. You're starting to feel better. Have at it. Look at the frontal lobe of their brain. What do you see? Don't say a little bit. You don't see anything. What's the frontal lobe of the brain responsible for? Insight, judgment, and empathy. What part of his brain is working? His reward system is working. His cravings are fully intact. I'm getting ready to send Monty Burks back out into a world after being detoxed off of 10 days with a fully functioning reward system and no ability for insight, judgment, and empathy. What's the success rate of detoxing people and sticking them back on the street? Zero. I've got an ER doc in here somewhere that says that, you know, that's, that was the thing. Get them in, get them out. When you stick them back out, they've got a 100% chance of failure. What do insurance companies reimburse the most for? Detox. They reimburse the most for the least effective thing that we do. So when you are asking, what can we do going forward? This is a start. We can look at what we know and we can take action around that. All right, bottom row of brains. How long did I tell you doctors and airline pilots stay in treatment? 90 days. Look at that bottom row of brains. Look at the frontal lobe of their brain. What do you see? Starting to see some red and yellow, aren't you? Insight and judgment coming back. And that's where community becomes so important. That's why Monty Burks runs the state. He's trying to build these rat parks. He's trying to build community for people who lack insight and judgment so that they don't have it themselves, but they get effective feedback from people like I did for you when you were trying to, to, get, to get your life in order until the frontal lobe of the brain can come back online, right? And that's why doctors and airline pilots do so well. How long does it take to go from the bottom row of brains to the top row of brains? Anybody know? Two years. 
That's why medication works, guys. Nobody's gonna get 90 days of treatment, five years of aftercare and follow-up and leverage. It doesn't happen anywhere outside of those two professions. Medications quell cravings. Cravings are why people relapse. If I can hold somebody in my program with a medication to quell their cravings, I can give the frontal lobe of their brain time to work up and they can make better insight and judgment going forward, but we have to be able to support that. We know why. And guys, all you gotta do is just look at the people that have been successful and you can match it to this. They're successful for a reason. I'm successful because I was given quality treatment and I followed this paradigm. You follow the same thing, only you're using medication to get there. What makes you any difference than me? I cost more money to make than you did. And that's the truth. And we can't treat people, guys, based on their ability to pay, although we do it all the time. I hope we don't get there overall. Everybody with me? All right. Anybody know who this guy is? It's the second seven. I've got till 20 after, so I'm still on time. Judge, did you just text me? <laughs> okay. The second seven. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to call you out. All right. This is Vincent Felitti. Vincent Felitti was a lead author on the ACEs study. He ran a weight loss clinic out in California in the 1980s, and he had morbidly obese women for the most part, four or 500 pounds. He would treat them, they would, get, they would lose weight, they would get better, and then they would relapse. And he's trying to figure out why do they keep going back? Why do they keep relapsing? They would put all the weight back on. And he had some idea that trauma played a role, so he started questioning the women that relapsed. And one of the questions he asked, he said, after he asked it the third time, he realized he asked the wrong question. And his question was, how much did you weigh the first time you had sex? And he said, after three patients, he said, I knew I asked the wrong question. Because the answers were 46 pounds, 48 pounds, and 50 pounds. What question should he ask? How old were you the first time you had sex? Is the question he should have asked. They were victims of incest within their own family. Okay? That was their childhood trauma, and he started to get an idea that childhood trauma was playing a big part in this. And the ACEs study was born out of that. And I'm gonna say this, and I've got my friend Rob here in the front row who, who, is, a, who is a statistics monster, and he's probably gonna get on me for this. I think it's the most important study ever done in the history of medicine, as far as its implications. Not only do high ACEs scores uh, uh, you know, contribute to your risk of addiction and, and suicide and mental health disorders, it also contributes to your risk of smoking, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. What's the economic impact of that? So I would argue that by addressing ACEs, we could actually address some of these other problems that we currently spend billions of, year, of dollars on each year in pharmaceuticals. We spend more money on pharmaceuticals than any country in the world, but we're not the first when it comes to life expectancy and overall health, and I think there's a reason, and I think a big reason is under addressing this underlying trauma. So that is the second seven. So Dr. Nolan, uh, go back to his scenario. He's got the family history. He's got a history of, of, childhood, um, uh, of childhood trauma. He's got this two sevens on the line. Now all he's waiting for is that prescription, and what did I tell you that doctors know about addiction or the proper prescribing of controlled substances? Nothing. Outside of James Chu in this room, how did doctors learn about a treatment of chronic pain? Who taught them? Wasn't in med school or residency, but they learned. Who taught them? Pharmaceutical industry taught them. The pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry can't be responsible for, treating our, uh, for teaching our doctors and residents and nurse practitioners and PAs about uh, proper prescribing controlled substances uh, nor addiction, and we absolutely uh, need to change that. So I'm gonna put my own story back in here again because I, I, I don't want us to move past this. The addressing of ACEs, I think, is the single biggest thing we can do from a prevention standpoint going forward to address addiction no matter what the drug is. And I, I, I mean, I, I just can't be convinced otherwise. So I'm gonna go back in time to, to, to Little Steve, uh, you know, a guy that I got to be in touch with again, walk on this campus, Little Steve at home, um, being physically abused. Um, and I'm not talking whippings, guys, I'm talking beatings, sticks, bottles, uh, anything that you can think of, uh, literally, uh, when I was growing up. I had an uncle who was sexually abusing me, molesting me uh, at first, and then uh, raping me at ages six and seven. All right, and then I go to school and I'm acting out. And the response is, is I get paddled, so I lived up to that. When I was coming through school, the first day of school, the teachers that graded I was getting ready to go into already knew my name because they had talked to the teachers of the last time. And I kept getting put in slow classes. Back then, they put you in classes based on you know, how you did in school, so I was always put into slow classes. And I had a teacher in seventh grade that changed my life. His name's John McConville. And John pulled me out of that class and put me in the, in the smart kids class. And I looked around and all the smart kids were there and I thought I was one of them. I wound up getting to go to med school. 
And so I, want, I wonder what, how my life would have been different had John McConville not pulled me out of that because I certainly wasn't having any of the childhood trauma addressed. So you ask what can be, got, be done. And I wasn't planning on putting this in my talk, but it's here. Anybody ever heard of Fall Hamilton Elementary School in Nashville? Look it up. All right. Go to YouTube and put in Fall Hamilton Elementary School. They got a seven-minute video on, TV, on, on, on YouTube, and I looked at it, and I couldn't believe it. They're a trauma-based elementary school in West Nashville. The zip code that they're in is one of the highest incarcerated zip codes in the United States, and these kids come in, and they're awesome. They're awesome, but it's a trauma-based curriculum. So when they're acting out, they don't put them in the corner. They don't whip them in front of their other classmates. They know stuff's going on at home, and they try to involve the family in that as well, and it's trauma-based through and through. Every one of their teachers are trauma-trained, every one. They have a trauma coordinator that the state's getting ready, uh, or it was, it was contemplating pulling their funding. Please don't. It's 62000 And if you won't fund it, I will. Because the day I went there, I just walked up. As those of you who know me know what I tend to do. I didn't know anything about Fall Hamilton, so I went and knocked on the door. They don't let you in school anymore. There's a bunch of things you have to do. But after I survived that process, I met a, a young man who's the principal there named Matthew Portell. And Matthew took me around that school and I got to see it uh, for a whole half day and I was overcome because I wonder how my life would have been different. I wonder how your life would have been different. I wondered how the, suicide, uh, the suicides that we've talked about, I wonder how their life would have been different if somebody had intervened and realized what was going on in their homes with regards to childhood trauma. Guys, that's what we're talking about. The people that are in Judge Sloan's court, how would their lives be different if we actually changed the way we approach them and we stopped spanking them and we started looking at what was going on in their life? Second seven on the pay line. Third seven. We were taught by the pharmaceutical industry in the early 1990s that opioids weren't dangerous. If you're taking them for chronic pain, you couldn't get addicted to them. And uh, if you took them, that less than 2% of the people who took them got addicted. So said studies in the New England Journal of Medicine. Well, guys, this is the study in the New England Journal of Medicine. And for the, for the, for the statistics nerds in the room, uh, you know that this is not a study. This is not a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. Uh, this is a letter to the editor in 1980 edition of the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Herschel Jick, who worked at Mass General, who said we had about 11,000 patients in the hospital who received an opioid preparation while they were hospitalized, and when they got out, only two of them became addicted. Guys, that is not a clinical study. That is anecdotal data, and that is not comparing apples to apples. That is not the treatment of chronic pain. That is the treatment of acute pain. And Purdue Frederick built their marketing empire on these 100 words. And all the other companies that came along says, oh, we didn't do that. Nope, but you certainly cashed in with your generic equivalents and pumped them into counties that you were pumping in way more drugs than they had. You are compliant. I read where one of the drug manufacturer or distributors executives was talking about how much they were pumping into these small counties. And he said he was comparing them to Doritos. And he said, well, we can just make more Doritos. Really? That's the suicide overdose, right? That's the, the guy who walks into the pharmacy and kills two of your folks. Uh, I lose a patient a week, somebody that I love every single week, secondary to drug overdose because they've relapsed, and he's calling them Doritos. Um, I think that, I think that there, there has to be repercussions for that. That's the third seven, and that's the basis of it. So if I'm a doctor and I understand just that, I can risk stratify my patient. If they're at risk, we can put in a plan uh, going forward so that I can address their pain uh, and I have to be open to that if they start to develop problems, that I don't blame it on them, that I understand what their underlying disorder is, and I seek to get them help with it in a non-judgmental way. How do we deal with it in our doctor profession? And don't, don't you give me anything that ain't true. You know how we deal with it. When we find it, we kick them out. Oh, I looked at Control Substance Monitoring Data Bank, and they're going to 10 doctors and six pharmacies. I kicked them out of my practice. You just uh, increased the street price of heroin, fentanyl, and pills because you've increased the demand without doing anything at all about the supply. And I'm, I, I hate to be so straightforward there, but when you talk about things that we have to change in stigma, guys, the reason you did that is because of the stigma associated with addiction. All right, I told you, uh, oh, sorry. It's, I told you we're gonna use two quotes. The second one is from my boy Tyson. Tyson said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And there's nothing more true than that. I told you, don't sleep on him. That's actually better than Da Vinci. 
So we've come up with all these things. Our, our former governor, uh, Governor Bill Haslam, uh, and, and the folks in our state legislature have done some wonderful things. The Control Substance Monitoring Data Bank, we were ahead of the curve on that. Requiring providers to check it, we were ahead of the curve on that. Uh, you know, chronic pain guidelines, we were ahead of the curve on that. We've decreased morphine equivalents prescribed in our state by 1.5 billion. We've decreased doctor shopping by 70%. We have not appreciably increased access to quality treatment for addiction, and our overdose numbers continue to climb, and they will. We're moving in the right direction. We have to increase access to treatment. Stabilization first. If you're addicted to heroin, okay, if you get dope sick, if you have uh, ever overdosed in your life, right, or if you stop taking the drug you're taking and you go into withdrawals, that is immediate medication that day, right then, in the spot that you're in, and we will decrease overdose deaths, I promise you. But we won't do it because EDs look at it, oh, you're trading one drug for another, I need to get them out of my ED, All right? And we keep doing that. I'm not talking that they're gonna have to be on it the rest of their life. They may or not, I don't give a crap. What I'm talking about is keeping them alive because I hadn't figured out a way to treat dead people yet. And when I figured that out, then we can go a different direction. But that is the single biggest thing that we can do right now to stem the tide. And then an, a, a, an evaluation for proper level of care and put those services in place that we need to help people's frontal lobes recover over time where they gain insight and judgment. And then if you don't care about anything else, they can become a tax-paying citizen. Tyson was right, All right? We got a plan, but we've been punched in the face. And here's that punch in the face. Tommy showed you a little bit of it, and I love Tommy wherever he is. He's taught me so much. Looks like a 10 milligram Percocet, right? 10 milligram Percocet. This is what killed one of my idols, Prince. I'm a child of the 80s. Prince is one of my musical heroes. Prince died of this. Okay, this looks like a 10 milligram Percocet, but it's not. It's fentanyl. What's the difference? Oxycodone, which is Percocet, is 1.5 morphine equivalent. Okay, so in a 10 milligram oxycodone, that's 15 morphine equivalents. I take that, I'm taking 15 morphine equivalents. Fentanyl is 100 to 10,000 morphine equivalents. So if you buy this and you think it's oxycodone and it's fentanyl, it's, 10, it's, it's 100 to 10,000 times more potent than what you think you're taking. And you take one pill and you die. And it's what happened to Prince. Prince overdoses on an airplane, lands, they, re, they reverse him. He leaves the hospital, AMA, goes back to Minnesota, sends for an addiction medicine doc in Southern California. Meanwhile, he gets dope sick. His cravings are 10 times stronger for his drug than your, than, uh, than your cravings are for food when you're hungry. So his boys go to the street, they grab him some 10 milligram Percocet, he takes the same dose he's been taking every single day. And he dies. Guess what drug was not in his toxicology report? Oxycodone. Guess what was? Fentanyl. The parents in the room, if you want a reason to stay up at night and worry, worry because of this. You never know what hits you. It's the same thing you've been taking every day. I'm gonna close with this. I love this picture. Uh, this, is, uh, this is last summer. I, got, I told you I got to go to Italy. That's my favorite place in the world, Florence, Italy in the background. Um, and uh, there's Heathy. Uh, he's right over there. Uh, there. There I am. But I want you to look at this. There's Karen. Uh, I want you to look at this. That looks pretty innocent, doesn't it? That's where the majority of my money goes. That's my daughter, Haley. And for the, and for the dads in the room, uh, any of you that have little girls know what I'm, what I'm getting ready to say is right. At some point when you have a little girl, either the day that you have her or, or she's growing up, it dawns on you that you're gonna have to give her away one of these days. Right? You're gonna have to walk her down the aisle and, and, and Haley brought this thing home. Um, so now my son-in-law, Sterling, and this day that I dreaded my whole life, June 26, three years ago, happened. And so I'm standing at the back and I've got Haley on my arm and she leans her arm over and she says, Daddy, I love you. She said, you're the first man I ever loved. Thank you for everything that you ever did for me. So that day I dreaded my entire life uh, was certainly a pretty damn good day, right? But what she didn't know at the time is I knew something even more. In the program that day, I was not two numbers. I wasn't Stephen Lloyd, father of the bride, 1967 to 2003. I got to be there. I didn't have a pinch hitter. Because this, this is why we're here. This is it. We put our stigma and our biases to the side to give people a chance at that. Because that's what I'm talking about. I wasn't, I wasn't two numbers. I'm still 1967 dash. 
All right, for the dads in the room who've gotten a little bit of a break and now are looking forward to that day, at the end of the night, uh, when she gets in the car and goes to a hotel with that dude, that still sucks. So, uh, and to be honest with you, I haven't gotten over it yet. I'm still dealing with it. There's a lot of things we can do, and we're gonna discuss a lot of them over the next day and a half. Almost everything that we're gonna talk about fits in this framework somewhere. I'd encourage all of us to not let things die with this conference, uh, to continue to network. I can't tell you how many friends I have in this room, but I think together we can stem the tide, and I think together we can produce more of this picture rather than Ms. Jama's story uh, that started us today. Thank you, guys.